almost a thousand different kinds. creatures of popular myth. Bats are vitally important to life on Earth. Hi, I'm Hallie Singleton. And I'm Bert Granches. In this video, we're going to introduce you to the incredible world of bats, beginning with some amazing Texas bat caves. Bert is an expert on bats and has studied them since he was four years old. I love studying bats, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing my knowledge with you. Right now, I'm going to tell you about a very special place right here in Central Texas. Bracken Cave contains the largest colony of bats in the entire world, with more than 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats living there. Even though each bat weighs no more than two nickels, 20 million together weigh more than the combined weight of 55 elephants. That's a lot of bats. Many bats live in caves. These Mexican free-tailed bats return to this cave every spring to rear their young. Each square foot of cave wall is covered with up to 500 tiny hairless bat pups. The adults and pups roost separately, forming pink and brown patches on the walls. Mother bats give birth to just one baby a year. Each mother knows its own baby's unique voice and odor and is able to find and nurse her pup several times a day. The young are born very large, nearly a third the size of their mothers. And within three to four weeks after birth, they're exercising their wings. Their first attempt to fly is crucial. Young bats have to leap off into the air in complete darkness, having never flown before, and avoid colliding with thousands of other bats. It's amazing how mothers find their babies. Just imagine finding just one among millions and in total darkness. Bert, how did they avoid flying into each other? That sea was sound. To navigate in the dark, they use what is called echolocation. Bats send out ultra high frequency sounds and listen for the echoes. This enables them to find prey and avoid obstacles. In studying bats, I learned that their incredible faces are also adaptations for seeing with sound. Huge ears and distinctive nose leaves like these help bats hunt and avoid accidents. One of the greatest threats to bats comes from people who believe all kinds of dumb myths about them. People who don't know any better kill many thousands of bats every year. Isn't it incredible how people can fear such harmless animals? I mean, here we are. We're standing among millions of bats, yet we have nothing to fear as long as we leave them alone. That's true, Hallie. Bats never get caught in women's hair, none are blind, and they aren't dirty. They seldom get sick, but those that do rarely attack people. We simply fear things we don't understand. Bert, look. There's a young free tail bat caught in a bush. Do you think it's okay to take a closer look? Sure, Hallie. That's why I have these gloves. See his long, narrow wings? No wonder these guys can fly so fast. Will you explain its wing to us, Bert? Sure. Here's his thumb. These are the other four fingers. Right here are his feet. his tail, and look at his cute little face. Do you think this bat could have rabies? Probably not, Hallie. Very few bats have rabies, but the ones we can catch are most likely to be sick. That's why bat scientists get vaccinated against rabies, but we always wear gloves just to be extra safe. Let's let the bat go, okay, Bert? It sure is cool to watch all these bats and to think about all those bugs they're going to eat tonight. Wow, look at the hawks chasing the bat. 
Like other animals, bats do have predators, such as hawks, owls, and snakes. But the predators mostly catch the weakest or sick ones. This means the predators may actually help keep the bat colony healthy. Now let's talk about the feeding habits of bats. This California leaf-nosed bat is a highly specialized hunter that lives in the desert. It can actually hear the footsteps of a walking cricket. Most bats eat insects, but in a Costa Rican rainforest, there are more than a hundred species, and they eat many amazing things. One of these bats has such incredible echolocation that it can detect an object as fine as a human hair, sticking up just one millimeter above a pond's surface. Its pulses of sound have been slowed down 60 times so we can hear them. Once a fish has been detected, the fishing bat homes in and dragging its flattened, razor-sharp claws through the water, scoops up its prey. It seldom misses. Other carnivorous, that is, meat-eating bats, share this forest. The rarely seen Cretopterus bat has a wingspan of over two feet. It's an efficient predator that catches a wide variety of small animals. Vampire bats are shy and very misunderstood. They live only in Latin America, and even there, only one in tens of thousands of bats is actually a vampire. This bat feeds entirely on the blood of other animals, often domestic chickens and cattle on nearby farms. A chicken settles down to roost in a low tree. The vampire silently lands nearby and creeps along the branch. Heat detectors around the vampire's nose tell it where the chicken's blood vessels are closest to the surface. The vampire licks the skin to soften it while the chicken continues to sleep. One small bite and the bat then settles down to feed. An anticoagulant, something that stops the blood from clotting, is in the bat's saliva and helps the blood to flow freely. Medical researchers only recently discovered how to use the vampire's anticoagulant to treat human heart patients, demonstrating that even vampire bats can be of great value. There are also many other kinds of bats in the rainforest. These are essential to the forest survival. They pollinate a wide variety of flowers including these beautiful liana vine flowers on the island of Guam. Many kinds of bats carry seeds to new locations where they are more likely to grow. This is important for new plants to grow and spread. Bats are pretty incredible, Bert. I know, Hallie. I love bats, not only because they're really cool animals, but because they're also extremely important to people. Tropical markets are full of fruits from plants that, in the wild, rely on bats to pollinate their flowers or carry their seeds. Some of these fruits are guavas, peaches, avocados, bananas, and mangoes. The most important fruit of Southeast Asia is the durian fruit, with sales of $120 million a year to local economies. These flowers of the durian begin to open as the sun goes down. As night falls, the flowers produce nectar and pollen, getting ready for the arrival of the dawn bat, the key pollinator of durian trees. As this bat feeds on the flower's nectar, it is ensuring that the durian will bear fruit this season. Without the dawn bat, 
this important fruit growing industry may be lost. In the wild, bananas rely on bats too. Although commercially grown bananas do not require pollination, fresh genetic strains of wild plants are needed to keep cultivated varieties healthy. Bats can also be pretty important in our own backyards. One of the little myotis bats seen here can catch a thousand or more mosquito-sized insects in one hour and over 4,000 in a night. Just imagine what life would be like without bats. And if one bat can eat thousands of insects, think how many all these bats from just this cave can eat tonight. That's hundreds of millions. Enough to cause a lot of problems if the bats weren't around to eat. Well, no wonder scientists are so concerned about saving bats. everywhere, even on remote islands. They pollinate flowers in deserts. They carry seeds in rainforests. And they eat billions of bugs. Wherever bats live, other plants and animals depend on them to survive. Many bats live in caves year-round. They rear their young in warm caves each summer, then move to cool caves in the winter to hibernate. Hi, I'm Hallie Singleton. And I'm Burke Granches. Here at the James River Bat Cave in Central Texas, Mexican free-tailed bats have just finished rearing their young and soon will be leaving for caves in Mexico. By migrating south to warmer climates, they can remain active all winter, but they'll come back to Texas in the spring. In this video, we're going to explore where bats live and the important role they play in the balance of nature. Worldwide, many bats live in caves. These rosette fruit bats live in a warm African climate where they can remain active all year. Where winters are cold, bats must hibernate without food for as long as seven or eight months. That's because there are no insects to eat until spring arrives. Hibernation caves like this one must be carefully protected, and the bats are checked every two to three years to make sure they are all okay. Here we see Merlin Tuttle, founder of Bat Conservation International, and Bob Curry, a biologist for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, checking on the bats. When these bats hibernate, they wake up at the slightest disturbance. And if this happens too often, they use up the body fat supplies they need to hibernate. And without enough fat, they could starve to death before spring. While hibernating, the body temperature of this big brown bat will fall to that of its surroundings. The bat's heartbeat slows dramatically, and its blood barely moves through its veins. Dr. Tuttle has a probe to measure the bat's body temperature, which reads just over 30 degrees Fahrenheit. This means the bat is actually surviving below the freezing point. Nearby, in the same cave, but in a warmer location, rests one of North America's rarest bats. The eastern big-eared bat gets its name for obvious reasons. Throughout the cave, bats sleep on the walls and the ceiling. Here we see a little brown bat covered with condensed moisture, clinging to the wall. This little brown bat has spent every winter of its life in this cave. The species has been known to live for up to 34 years. In warm tropical areas, 
from Australia to the Pacific Islands in Africa. Large flying fox bats, like these, live right out in the open. They fan themselves to keep cool, and mothers shelter their babies beneath their wings. Trees, where these flying foxes roost, must be tall, easy to land in, and near their food. In Central America, Honduran white bats live in small family groups, clustered together beneath large leaves. They make a home for themselves by chewing along the leaf's midrib so that the two halves hang down, making a tent that shelters them when it rains. These thumb-sized fruit-eating bats will use this tent for several weeks before making a new one nearby. The adults are pure white with yellow noses and ears, but the young are gray. Many bats, especially those that live in the rainforests, roost in hollow trees. Bat expert Dr. Merlin Tuttle carefully checks the interior for poisonous snakes before venturing inside. Several species of bats live in the same tree, like the nectar-feeding glossophaga. And nearby are these fruit-eating corollia bats, who are important carriers of rainforest seeds. Bats are so fascinating, Bert, they obviously live in many places, but isn't each species adapted for a particular kind of roosting or feeding habitat? You're right, Hallie. Most bats are so well adapted for certain kinds of roosts and feeding habits that they simply can't change. Flying foxes cannot echolocate. They would get lost and die inside a cave. Honduran tent-making bats would die if they couldn't find the right kind of leaves to cut to make their homes. Can you imagine fishing bats pollinating flowers or nectar bats fishing? Many bats are so well adapted to use their big feet to catch fish or their long noses to pollinate flowers that they can eat only certain foods in certain habitats. These free-tailed bats have such long, narrow wings that they can hunt only out in the open. They rely on speed for catching quick flying insects. Only a bat with short broad wings can maneuver close to the ground to catch a cricket. Wherever bats go to feed, they are very important in keeping insect populations in balance. These 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats from Bracken Cave eat over 200 tons of insects each night. That's billions of insects that could cause major crop losses and destroy forests if bats weren't here to eat them. Bats that pollinate flowers are equally important in the habitats where they live. These agave flowers release nectar and pollen only at night, and they attract many bats. As long-nosed bats probe the flowers for food, they get showered with pollen. Without even knowing it, these bats pollinate hundreds of flowers in one night by traveling from plant to plant and spreading the pollen. Many other desert plants also depend on bats for pollination. The organ pipe cactus flowers open after sundown, ready for their nighttime visitors. Small groups of bats move from one plant to the next, taking turns feeding. The familiar saguaro is another cactus that is pollinated by bats. Saguaro blossoms don't open until midnight, so they can avoid competing with the other cacti. This way, the bats and plants are perfectly adapted to help each other. These long-nosed bats have muzzles that are perfectly shaped to fit deep inside the cactus blossoms like keys in a lock. Without the bats, many of the desert's most important plants could die out threatening the entire ecosystem. In East Africa, the baobab tree is a familiar part of the landscape. The tree is home to many birds, mammals, and other animals. So many, in fact, that it's known as the tree of life. The baobab tree relies on bats to pollinate its flowers. Like other plants pollinated by bats, 
The flowers open after sunset and wait for their nighttime visitors. Nectar is produced at the base of the large white petals as a tasty treat for the bats that visit the flower. As the epauletted bat moves from petal to petal in search of nectar, the bat's belly becomes covered with pollen, and the pollen is carried from flower to flower as it feeds. It's just amazing how important bats are to whole ecosystems. As we're seeing, the plants they pollinate are essential to the survival of all kinds of other animals. You said it, Hallie. Bats also play key roles in carrying seeds of a tremendous variety of plants in many habitats, from deserts to rainforests. Bats are especially important in tropical rainforests. It's only recently that we have begun to recognize how important tropical rainforest ecosystems are. These forests serve as the lungs of our planet, and they're also home to more than 90% of all plant and animal species that live on land. The delicate balance that exists between millions of unique plants and animals can be destroyed in a single afternoon. It's through the work of scientists like Dr. Scott Morey that we are beginning to discover just how important bats are to rainforests. The first new plants to grow in this clearing came from seeds dropped by bats. These plants are known as pioneer plants because they can grow in hotter, drier conditions than other rainforest plants. As these pioneer plants grow larger, they provide protective shade for other kinds of plants. Scott Morey points out to Merlin Tuttle some excellent examples of pioneer plants that rely on bats to carry their seeds into clearings. This one is a Cecropia. The fruit of the Cecropia hang down in bunches. The bats come to feed on the seed-packed fleshy fingers. Birds also feed on these fruits, but it's mainly bats that carry the seeds into clearings. The Solanum fruit seeds are also carried by bats. Look at how many tiny seeds there are. Many plants seem to have evolved their seed-laden fruits specifically for bats to carry. The piper has fruits that grow upward along its stems while the leaves hang below, making it easy for the bats to feed in flight. It has been estimated that just one Corolia bat can carry up to 60,000 seeds to new locations in a single night. Bats know by smell which fruit is ripe. A mother Corolia bat has to continue feeding despite the fact she's nursing her baby. The youngster, only a few days old, clings to its mother using its feet and thumbs even in flight. Mom continues to feed normally even though she is fine with her baby which weighs almost half her own body weight. She eats the piper like corn on a cob, then discards the tough stalk. Within minutes, the undigested seeds pass through her body and are scattered as she flies over the open patches of land. Since bats are the only animals that drop lots of seeds while flying over clearings, they are especially important to forest regrowth. Within two or three years, the clearings in the forest are already beginning to disappear. The beginning of the healing process is started by fruit-eating bats. Yet, despite their vital role, these bats are often killed by people who mistake them for vampires. With close to 1,000 species of bats, it really is incredible how each is adapted for a special habitat and way of eating. I bet we could study bats all our lives and still be discovering new adaptations and important roles they play. What's obvious, Bird, is that bats are vital to the balance of nature. I mean, imagine whole ecosystems from deserts to rainforests, all depending on bats. The truth is that all ecosystems depend on a wide variety of plants and animals to stay healthy. That's why we must be so careful to protect all habitats and species, including bats.
That research takes scientists, like Dr. Merlin Tuttle, into all kinds of amazing and adventurous places. Dr. Tuttle has probably observed more bats in more places than anyone in history. Hi, I'm Hallie Singleton. And I'm Bert Grantius. It's never too early to start becoming a scientist. By the time Bert was nine years old, he had learned so much about bats, all on his own, that Dr. Tuttle began taking him along on field trips, like this one to Big Bend. To most people, a bat is a bat, despite the fact that there are almost a thousand different species. But it's the wide variety of unique kinds of bats that Dr. Tuttle and young Bert here find so fascinating. They find the West Texas desert a rich hunting ground. Dr. Tuttle and Bert string a fine mist net low over the water. It is the easiest way for researchers to get a close look at the bats. Oh, it looks like we got a free tail here. So why do they call them free tails? Well, they call them free tails because, unlike most bats, they have a little bare tail like a mouse. <laughs> See the membrane here? Most bats have a membrane that comes all the way to the end of the tail. Notice that Dr. Tuttle is handling the bats with a glove. Like any wild animal, a frightened bat may bite in self-defense. It is not recommended that just anyone handle bats. This is a job left for scientists and those doing bat research. Oh, this is a big free-tailed bat. This is several times larger than the Mexican free-tailed bat that we just caught. In fact, these are quite rarely seen. In all, there are eight or nine different species of bats feeding or drinking in the small area. Hey, Bert, we got a ghost-faced bat here. See, here he has these really strange eyes that appear to be right back in his ears. And that's part of a very sophisticated navigation system that this bat has. There's no other bat in the United States that looks quite like him. It must have been a lot of fun to help an expert like Dr. Tuttle. Bert, how did you get to do that when you were so young? I first got interested in bats when I was four. My mom showed me some of Dr. Tuttle's photographs. After that, I was looking up everything I could find about bats. Now, I even started my own library. I also began asking my parents to take me to meet experts like Dr. Tuttle. A lot of them were very happy to help a kid who was really serious. I understand that you're now studying to be a bat scientist. It must take a lot of patience to help people to understand the importance of bats. In Austin, crevices beneath the Congress Avenue Bridge make a wonderful home for over a million Mexican free-tailed bats. A few years ago, people feared the bats and petitioned city officials to get rid of them. But at the time, Bat Conservation International was moving its headquarters to Austin, and through their efforts, public opinion changed. The bats are now appreciated and have become an important tourist attraction in Austin. Large numbers of people gather on summer evenings to watch the bats emerge. Each night, the bats eat 15 to 30,000 pounds of insects, helping to control pests throughout the area. As far as the people of Austin are concerned, the bats are here to stay. So was it really that easy for the citizens of Austin to want to help save the bats? Yes, Allie. See, we first took the time to understand that the people who wanted to kill the bats genuinely believed that they were dangerous. They were afraid. So the conservationists just simply helped these people to understand the importance of bats. 
the same ones who originally wanted to kill the bats ended up helping save them. Yes, that's right. Conservationists also helped at Hubbard's Cave in Tennessee, where careless cave explorers were disturbing one of the world's most important bat hibernation roosts. Thousands of bats were killed each winter. Not only that, but the Tennessee National Guard wanted to begin using the area for military practice. The conservationists met with cave explorers and found that many shared their concern about protecting the bats and their cave. The National Guard commander was also delighted to help once he understood the unique importance of the bats. So they all ended up working together? You bet, Hallie. The National Guard even carried many tons of materials up the steep mountain, and the cave explorers designed and built an enormous steel gate. At Hubbard's Cave, the bats are now protected by the gate in the winter, and responsible cave explorers are allowed to visit in the summer when the bats are gone. Once every two or three years, scientists must check on the bats to be sure they are still safe. Dr. Tuttle and his colleague, Bob Curry, from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, enter the cave only briefly. Hubbard's Cave provides a range of temperatures from above 50 degrees to below freezing, making it suitable for an unusually wide variety of species. Thousands of endangered gray bats hang from the ceiling, living on fat reserves that build up before they begin to hibernate. On the other side of the world, as dusk falls over a Buddhist monastery in Thailand, an amazing spectacle sweeps through the sky. Millions of bats stream out of their daytime roosts and spread over the surrounding forests and farmland. Just 15 years ago, there were very few left. Although major losses are common around the world, such bats can be saved with help from conservationists. In Thailand, poachers were catching too many bats as they left their cave. The poachers who catch these bats are not bad men. They are simply poor and struggling to feed their families. The bat cave is owned by the monastery, and the monks have good reason to fear losing the bats. Their bats are worth far more alive than dead. Among the bats, many valuable contributions. Their droppings, or guano, make excellent fertilizer. Once a week, the monks hire local villagers to enter certain parts of the cave, where high ceilings minimize disturbance to the bats. These people are not here to collect the bats. They're here to collect the bat droppings that fall to the floor of the cave in a constant shower. The bat droppings are sold to farmers as fertilizer, and the money made is very important to the local economy. This case seems complicated, Hallie. The poachers earn a living killing and selling bats, and the monks and villagers earn theirs by keeping the bats alive so they can harvest the guano. What did the conservationists do? Well, Dr. Tuttle and a Thai assistant went out and found the poachers. Dr. Tuttle made friends with them and convinced them to show them how they caught and sold bats. He learned that they were putting nets over the cave entrance to catch the larger fruit-eating bats to sell. But they were also catching many thousands of insect-eating bats that they could not sell. These bats were killed needlessly. So what did Dr. Tuttle do? After carefully documenting the problems, Dr. Tuttle met with the monks and the local leaders and explained that nets set over the cave entrance were killing thousands of bats that couldn't even be sold. He recommended that a game warden be hired to guard the cave and that the poachers be allowed to legally net the fruit bats at a distance where they could not kill more than the population could support. The bats are now recovering under the watchful eye of a warden, and the growing harvest of bat droppings sell for almost $100,000 a year. That's a great story about conservationists working with the local community. It really is important to consider both human and wildlife needs when solving conservation problems, especially as our population grows. It sure seems to help when we can respect even those people who do things we don't like. It's also great to ask questions and get the facts straight before interfering in any other person's business. Then, people listen. 
One of the most difficult conservation projects ever involves vampire bats. Vampire bats live only in Latin America, and they were rare before the forests were cut and replaced by cattle ranches. With such an easy food supply, vampires multiplied and began to cause a lot of problems for ranchers. The amount of blood taken by a vampire is small, but they can cause cows to die of rabies. Vampires live mostly in small groups by themselves, in caves or hollow trees, and are difficult to find. In contrast, other bats form large colonies that are easily noticed. It sounds like when ranchers have problems with vampires, they mostly find and kill other bats instead of vampires. That's exactly right, Hallie. In fact, the biggest colonies of insect-eating bats are usually the first to die when their caves or hollow tree roosts are burned or otherwise destroyed. Many conservationists got angry and tried to stop ranchers and their governments from killing the wrong bats. But a solution wasn't found until the conservationists got to know the ranchers and realized that they could actually benefit by helping each other. They all ended up working together to make a training video about how to control vampires without harming beneficial species. In fact, it's now used throughout Latin America. In the video, Dr. Hugo Vargo, a recognized leader in vampire control from Costa Rica, explains to a ranch hand that simply burning a hollow tree will not solve his vampire problems. He will create even more trouble when beneficial bats are destroyed and are no longer there to help control insects that harm crops. It looks like the best solutions are found when conservationists try to help people as well as animals. That's right, Bert. And just remember that no animal, not even the vampire, is all bad. For example, by studying vampire bat saliva, medical scientists had developed a new clot-busting chemical for treating human heart and stroke patients. All bats, like other animals, have value when they are properly understood. But sadly, just as we are beginning to understand the many values of bats, we're also discovering that they rank among the world's most endangered animals. When our grandparents were born, bats filled our skies nearly everywhere. But since then, we've lost millions, and some species have even become extinct. Helping people appreciate bats is a real challenge. But I know most people would help if they just understood. Singleton. And I'm Bert Granchus. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Merlin Tuttle, founder of Bat Conservation International. He's here to help explain where bats might live in your neighborhood. Merlin, what kind of habitats do bats need to live? First of all, all bats have to drink and eat every night. They need to live near a lake, river, pond, or a stream like this. And this area right here is really great for bats because it's open, they can swoop down and get a drink easily. And there are many kinds of plants nearby. Insects live in these plants, meaning the bats have lots of food here. Also, there are great big trees around where bats can live, and this combines to provide ideal habitat for bats. Now we're going to go and have a look at some specific places where bats might live. Bats live in some pretty unexpected places. They can be as near as the bridge we're walking on. Let's take a look underneath. Here we have bats in a crevice. And nearby, in a hole. Well, I understand that highway departments are now intentionally building bat crevices into new bridges. What convinced them to do that? People are finally discovering how beneficial bats are. And it really doesn't cost a lot to provide extra crevices in the new bridges we build. 
Mexican free-tailed bats eat some of the most harmful insect pests in America. They like living in bridges because they're rarely disturbed there. We're going to take just a brief look because it's really important always to leave roosting bats alone. Right here in this yard, we have several places that are ideal for bats. Take, for example, this old tree. We have a crevice, loose bark, and a knot hole up there where bats can get in. Perfect places for bats to live. Well, why is this crevice good for bats? If this crevice were any wider, it'd be dangerous for the bats because predators like house cats could get in and catch them. But the way it is, they can go inside and be safe. Why do bats like loose bark, Merlin? Loose bark bur is just another type of crevice. The bats go in deep underneath. This one would probably only be used by bachelor bats because it's shaded and it's not quite warm enough for mother bats to rear their young. Actually, many of the mother bats would prefer to rear their young in houses like this, which are heated by the sun. What kinds of crevices should we look for in a house? Hallie, almost any crevices between a half and three quarters an inch wide could provide a good home for bats. In really hot places, bats sometimes need a shaded site, but really most climates, bats would rather have a lot of sun on their homes to keep them warm so that they can rear their babies well. If I don't have any good places in my yard for bats, is there anything I can do to attract them? Yes, Hallie. Many people nowadays build bat houses like this one. Well, let's show Hallie how it's put together. Yeah, Bert. A house like this is really quite simple to build. Take a look here. It's just made of two pieces of plywood and some slats around the outside to keep the plywood far enough apart to give a space for the bats to roost in. We put this plywood up here like this. Now you notice we've got a plastic screen here. Bats like to be able to climb easily and this provides them a way to land and climb up inside. Now we put one more piece on the front like this. And this space in between, that is so that on extra hot days, the heat can come down and escape there. The bats move below where it's cooler so that they stay out of the heat. And on cool days, they go up where it's the warmest so that they always have the right temperature. This is put together very simply with screws like this. We don't have to put these all in. You can see that there are a couple screws in the bottom and all the way around the top and the other side. They don't go in this half inch crevice. When the bats go into the house, they actually crawl up behind this first piece and live up in the top unless it gets too hot. Bert, why is it painted brown? Hallie, bat houses are painted brown in most areas to absorb the right amount of heat for the bats inside. In colder areas, they can be painted black and that'll keep the houses even warmer. Well, once you have it built, does it make any difference where you put it? Yes, Hallie, it makes a lot of difference. Take, for example, right here. It's too shaded on this side of the house. It wouldn't get warm enough for mother bats to rear their young. If you look up even higher, that might be great, except that you got tree limbs too close because owls can sit on those and pounce on the bats when they come out, and the bats don't want to live there for that danger. Let's take a look now around the other side of the house. Hallie, this side of the house is ideal for a bat house. See, it faces east where it's gotten full sun all morning long, but in the middle of the day, it starts to get a little bit shaded, and that's perfect for this location. If we were further north, we would want a house that faced south so that it would be in the sun all day. In most areas, you can find a good place for a bat house if you just understand what the bats need.